Sandwiched between the giddy 1920s and World War II, the 1930s saw a huge disparity in the lifestyles of the common man in cities and towns across the country. Innovation and increased efficiency at home and at work allowed for some more leisure time as people embraced cultural and social pursuits such as literature, film, music, and partying. But at the same time, the devastating effects of the Depression left many with no such ability to enjoy those pursuits. The city of Leominster, with its mills and plastic factories churning night and day, at least allowed residents to stay employed as they struggled to maybe work their way slowly out of the Great Depression. By the end of the 1930s, things were looking better economically locally as war clouds began to form in Europe. At that time, an enterprising young producer named Edwin Cooper traveled the country producing short films in and of cities and towns across the country. This is the story of one of those films, made in Leominster at the end of the 1930s, and how it came back to light after not being seen for nearly three quarters of a century. This is the story of the film, It Happened in Leominster. The film, which is the subject of this story, is a relic from days long past, before online streaming, before personal computers, and even before the advent of television. It was, and is once again, a wonderfully clear and wide open window to the sights and sounds of Leminster's past. One of the missions of Leminster Access Television has always been to document, preserve, and make available to the public the rich cultural history of Leminster through the use of still and motion picture imagery. Our work at LATV puts us in the wonderful position of being able to archive and present these images to the residents of Leminster and beyond through our local access channels and our website. It has also been my pleasure to be a participant in a wonderful coalition that was formed in Leominster almost 10 years ago. This group, consisting of Leominster Access Television, the Leominster Public Library, the Leominster Historic Society, and the Leominster Historical Commission, meets regularly to share knowledge, ideas, and images uh, for each of our projects that we may be working on. This group's combined collective of imagery is an extremely valuable resource for historical scholars and researchers. But we have to start this story back in 1997 with Mr. M. Donald Kimmerini, who is the current chairman of the City of Leominster Historical Commission. He was in the process of compiling a history book of Leominster and was looking for photos and film of Leominster's past history. He was approached by Leominster resident John Ashton, who relayed his knowledge of a film produced in the 1930s about the city of Leominster. Well, John Ashton came in here in 97, and he explained to me about how we used to work at the Plymouth Theater. But eventually, the Plymouth Theater oh, yeah. dissolved, and the content of the projection booth had to be so, so there was a guy by the name of Ben Hall that came from Edgartown, Martha's Vineyard. Now, why in particular Ben Hall is because, in actuality, John Ashton knew of him because John had a place on Martha's Vineyard and he knew that the Ben Hall ran a few theaters out there. So. Ben Hall came to Leominster, went to the Plymouth Theater, and bought the content of the projection booth. In the process, John said that he bought film of the 1938-1940 activities of Leominster. That intrigued me. This was the type of material that Don was trying to get his hands on. After speaking with Mayor Dean Mazzarella, it was decided that the Historical Commission and the Mayor's Office should work to contact Benjamin Hall regarding trying to get a copy of that film footage. Uh, when Don contacted me, I realized time was pretty important because you never know what might happen and where these might end up uh, or when somebody decides to just clean things out. But, um, so we were able to find a phone number and a gentleman's name 
and uh, make you know phone calls, and we uh, you know sent letters out from the mayor's office saying this is really important. You tell us where they are, we'll come get them, whatever is necessary. Years and years went by, and we, you know we kept sending letters and phone calls, and uh, you know getting a little bit concerned. Sometimes a seemingly hot lead can turn into a long, cold winter of waiting, and with no immediate response to the letter, the film search was put on the back burner. Over the years, Mayor Dean Mazzarella mentioned this film to me in passing conversations about Lemister's visual history, but I always came away from these discussions thinking that this gentleman with the film footage must not want to part with this material, or has been just too busy to respond to inquiries. We must now fast forward to March of 2011 when local historian and researcher Don Montrum became involved. He sat in here, right, Donald Montrum. He wanted a project, as far as I could understand. And I presented him with all the information. He went and he got a file with about three or four copies of correspondence between the town and the fellow who evidently purchased what was left over from the old Plymouth Theater in town. And he said he would follow through it. I said, oh, that would be great. I said, how are you going to follow through with it? You're going to go to Martha's Vineyard? No. He said, I'll go to LA TV. I'll talk to Carl Piamarini. I'll, I'll talk to, to Jack, Sully, and maybe they will come up with something. I said, lots of luck. We've been trying for over 10 years, no luck whatsoever. On April 13th, Don Montrum had a lengthy conversation with Mr. Hall regarding the long sought after moments to film. I did talk to him and his secretary, and then his secretary did some inquiries for me, and she came back and said, well, he would be very willing to work with us to make those films available for whatever we would do with them. Don ended the conversation with Mr. Hall, and he promised him that someone would be reconnecting with him soon to talk more with him about the film in question. So at this point, Don handed the football to me. On April 26th, I placed my first phone call to Mr. Hall using the cell phone number that Don had given me. Mr. Hall answered, and my first impression of him was that of a serious businessman. He owned several movie theater complexes on Martha's Vineyard, and was also a film projectionist, which made matters easier in explaining what he had in his possession. He started by relaying to me that he was in possession of four 1,000-foot rolls of 35-millimeter nitrate film that he had secured from a movie theater being torn down in Lemonster in the early 1970s. He did not remember the name of the theater, but he did remember that it was located right downtown. It was situated directly over a brook. At that time, he was contacted by a Lemister projectionist named John Ashton, who thought Mr. Hall may be interested in salvaging some projection equipment from the old theater. When he found the films lying in a corner of the projection room, he decided to remove them so that they would not be destroyed in the process of tearing down the building. Mr. Hall took the films back to the vineyard, and he had them stored at his other house and had not seen them in years. So he was uncertain about the condition, but he would check them out and call me back in a few days. In the meantime, I began to formulate a plan on a few of the technical aspects of dealing with this film. When Carl first approached me about restoring the Benjamin Hall film, we had a pretty big problem because it was 35 millimeter. And at LATV, although we've been doing uh, a lot of film restoration were pretty much limited to 8mm, super 8mm, and 16mm. Besides the fact that it was 35mm, it presented another problem, and that was that it was nitrate film. Uh, nitrate film has the distinct quality of being extremely flammable, and the more deteriorated the film is, the more likelihood uh, you can have uh, an accident where if a spark uh, was present and some of the nitrate dust was in the air, you, it, you know, you could have a pretty good fire. Uh, we did at times test the flammability by uh, 
taking a frame of nitrate film in an ashtray and putting a match to it, and I mean, it goes up, it goes up like nitro, nitroglycerin. Projection booth fires were not uncommon in the early decades of cinema if a film managed to be exposed to too much heat, and several incidents resulted in audience deaths by flames, smoke, or the resulting stampede and panic at the theaters. There was also the difficult problem of having Mr. Hall's film eventually shipped to us for copying. Since 911 shipping nitrate film it has to be packaged, handled, labeled by someone who's uh, hazmat certified. As these various issues unfolded, I began formulating a plan as to how I would have to physically travel to Martha's Vineyard to perhaps borrow this film from Mr. Hall and then get it to a lab somewhere to have it transferred to a digital video format for viewing and for long-term preservation. When, when, when we found out that um, Benjamin Hall lived in Martha's Vineyard and that we were gonna have to go pick the film up, uh, we thought of taking a, a field trip, but it probably would end up being a two-day field trip. So we said, how can we do this? And we got the idea, uh, Charlie Valera, who's a, you know, a pilot out of Fitchburg Airport and a longtime friend and acquaintance. He's really into some of the stuff we do with the, uh, with the restoration. Uh, offered to fly us down pretty much for fuel cost. On August 24th, 2011, I placed another call to Mr. Hall. By this time, Mr. Hall had relocated the film and he checked on its condition. He reported that the film was in excellent shape. He mentioned that while he was assessing its condition, he was able to look at the opening credits of the film on a small viewer, and the film was entitled, It Happened in Lemonster, produced by someone named Edwin Cooper. He also mentioned that the film showed people exiting factories and churches, school children leaving school buildings, street scenes, and a parade. I thought to myself, wow, we had hit some pay dirt here. I asked him if he would allow us to borrow the film to get it transferred to digital video. And to my surprise, he told me we could have the film, since it really has no value to him. When I got off the phone, I was excited to say the least that after all of these years, we would finally get our hands on this complete film. And I decided in the meantime to do a little more research on It Happened in Lemonstown. First, I placed a call to librarian Diane Sanabria at the Lemister Public Library. I was somewhat aware that the library had secured some 35 millimeter film footage back in the late 1990s, which sounded very similar to the footage I was tracking down. The library had secured a grant to have this transferred to video, which they showed at a public presentation back in the late 1990s. Years later, Diane had given LATV a VHS copy of this footage, which we had in our archival collection, and I had remembered looking at it and wondering about its origin. I asked Diane what she knew about the film that she had transferred back then. All she knew was that it was one reel of black and white 35 millimeter nitrate film that was in their collection for a long time, and it consisted of about 10 minutes of footage showing lemons to locals, businesses, and churches. She mentioned that the film had no titles, no credits, or any other information. When she saw it at the time, although it was wonderful footage of Lemonster from around the 1930s, it had seemed like it was disjointed and she felt that it was not a complete film story and it probably was just bits and pieces of a larger project. Now I realized that what Diane had was probably outtakes or snippets of the entire four-reel, 40-minute program called It Happened in Lemonster that we were about to get our hands on. And the titles of the film, uh, they had the producer's name, Edwin Cooper, and they also had the star. Her name was Ava Thomas. So I went online and I found that there were some films that were produced back in the 30s, and, and I believe that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of this had to do with promoting business after the Depression to keep local business going. And uh, they would go into a town like Lemonster, a, a mill city, a, a manufacturing town, and they had a, uh, they had a canned script. 
The script to these It Happened In films was always the same in each city and town, and it centered around a very simple boy meets girl love story. Of course he met a girl, and as she was a Mayfair girl, it was love at first sight. And what they would just do is juxtapose the name of the town. It happened in Lemister, it happened in Poughkeepsie, it happened in Hoboken, it happened in Springfield. Uh, I don't know how many they actually did, but we were able to go on to a, uh, an archive site called archive.org. And we did a search and we found a couple of other films from other towns in their entirety uh, that were done by this group, very similar to the one that happened in Lemonster. I then had a fading memory that years ago the Fitchburg Historical Society may have had a film in their collection that was very similar in both title and description. Putting two and two together, it was obvious that this gentleman, Edwin Cooper, probably made a living traveling the East Coast and perhaps beyond, producing these short films for local theaters, highlighting local small towns and its luminaries, its organizations, its businesses. Mr. Cooper was more than likely funding his productions by getting local business sponsors by enticing them with the fact that their businesses would be highlighted in these films. Here's the finest beverages you could buy. Blue Anchor Ginger Ale and all True Flute popular flavors. Only 15 cents per bottle. See Ben Fairman's real sale of all products this weekend. Well, now that we had a handle on the story of this film, it was now time to make arrangements to pick it up. I rendezvoused with pilot Charlie Valera on September 19th, 2011 at 9 a.m. at Fitchburg Municipal Airport. It was a perfectly clear day for flying down to Martha's Vineyard. Charlie did the pre-flight on his plane, checked out the maps, wheeled the plane out, and we were off. I had pre-arranged for Mr. Hall to meet us at the Edgartown Airstrip at around 10 a.m. since the flight would take about 45 minutes from Fitchburg. The flight was wonderful. Charlie was giving me flying tips and showing me all the instrument panels and controls all along the way. As we approached Martha's Vineyard, we had to dart in and out of some of those beautiful, white, fluffy, fair weather clouds, which gave us breathtaking views as we came in and out of the cloud cover. After a few minutes of figuring out the landing strip layout of the grassy airstrip, Charlie gently put us down in Edgartown. As we landed and taxied toward the tower, I noticed in the distance a gentleman standing next to his vehicle with a cell phone up to his ear. When my own cell phone then rang, I realized that this gentleman must be Benjamin, or Buzz, as his friends called him, Hall. Sure enough, I walked up and we shook hands, and then he told me the story of the It Happened in Lemonster film and how he acquired it. We talked for about 10 minutes. Then Mr. Hall handed the films over to me, which I promptly put into the cargo bay of the plane. And because we all had very strict time schedules to stay on, we said our goodbyes and we were off again back to Fitchburg. Upon returning back to LATV, Jack Selly and I got to work scrutinizing the film reels to get as much info off them as we could before making arrangements to bring them to the TFG Film Lab in Connecticut for transfer to video. Jack gave the films a careful scrutiny to check for splices, broken sprocket holes, or tears. Remarkably, when, when we got the film back uh, and we decided to inspect it, it was in unbelievable condition. I mean, no deterioration whatsoever, maybe a little bit of shrinkage, but um, it was in great condition. And we were, we were kind of befuddled with identifying when this film was shot. We were trying to find some more information if there was anything in the, the local newspapers about it. So on the, on the side of the film, um, when Kodak made the film, they used to impregnate it with an edge code. And the edge code would either be a circle or a triangle or a square or a combination thereof. And there is a chart where if, if you look at the combination of those shapes in their code, you can reference from 35 millimeter, 16 or 8 millimeter, what year the film was manufactured. So we determined that it was manufactured in 1938 by the Edge Code. And in looking at the film, most of the people were wearing overcoats. So we figured it had to be in the fall.
When I went to do my search at the library, I selected, it was the uh, October, November, December reel of what at that time was the Sentinel or the appropriate paper. And fortunately, the first roll, I remember it was uh, October, around October 22nd was the first ad that I ran across asking for a call for people who might be interested in taking part in the film. And then after that, it was early in November when I found the site's uh, advertisements from the Plymouth Theater announcing the film and the rest. And after that, the rest is history. I believe it ran for about five days uh, in the local theater. On October 18, 2011, Jack and I brought the film down to Hartford, Connecticut to the TFG Film Lab dropped it off with their technician, George, who showed us his transfer equipment. Both Jack and I were confident that we had chosen the right lab for this delicate transfer. A week later, we made the return trip to pick up the transferred video of the film material. The first thing we did when we returned back to LATV was to capture this video transfer onto our editing computer so that we could finish the work on this preservation project. What we saw when we first saw this transfer footage was a moment we will never forget. You now know the story of how this film came about and was reborn. And now, thanks to the work of the various groups and individuals mentioned that combined their forces to bring this film back to light, we can now share this experience with you. For those of you that are about to watch this, you are in for quite a treat. Your obvious interest in history will be rewarded with an unparalleled look back to what life was like in Lemonster over 70 years ago. Many of you will be lucky enough to actually recognize family members, relatives, and acquaintances as they went about their lives in a different era. So, get ready. You are all about to become time travelers. Enjoy the ride.